Hi, this is Carl Gottlieb. I'm not a nerd, but I enjoyed working for Project Nerd, and you'll find the results on screen here. Five kids to Ahoy and welcome to another episode of CF3. I'm Dane Michael. And I'm James Marvs. And you're gonna need a bigger belt. I'm I, sorry. I went with the low-hanging fruit. I, I, <laughs> sorry. So, it's fair, it's fair. You like my captain's hat? Uh, I just got off the. What's the, the name? SS asshole. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is a cheap hat, but it's real. This is not. <laughs> and it's getting the job done. Um, are you drinking any Jaws themed um, beverages today? I am. <laughs> it's a cow. Okay, I'm drinking. Just kidding, a, um, I, Dane. I'm just kidding. Of course. Big wave. <laughs> of course. <laughs> big wave. I like it. We landed a big fish for this Jaws episode. I'm talking about screenwriter and actor. He played Meadows in the film, the, the news reporter. Uh, Mr. Carl Gottlieb. And we're not going to waste any time here. We're going to take you right to that interview with Carl, which was fantastic. Let's focus on Jaws for a moment. My understanding is that you met Steven Spielberg because you shared an agent. Yep. And he would often pair his, try to like pair his clients in certain ways. Mike, Mike Metavoy was into packaging before it was a Hollywood habit. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so Benchley had already done three drafts of a script. And Benchley did drafts because that was a way of giving him more money for the novel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so they they gave him this his novel price, and then they hired him to write a couple of drafts of the screenplay for more money. But he was married to the novel, so his versions were you know. Inadequate. Tell me about this um, six-hour session the first time you met Spielberg to work on. Um... I knew Spielberg. We were friends. Oh, okay. We we would I I had acted in two Spielberg movies. We went to parties together. He hung out at my house because I had an interesting bunch of people that would come over. So we knew each other. <clears throat> and uh, Mike Metavoy was the agent. Later went on to run United Artists. But at that time, he was an agent, put us together. And we wrote some th stories together, which I found. I Some of them are very good. But we couldn't sell them because Stephen was locked in to direct. And nobody would take a chance on Stephen as a first-time director. He had done Sugarland Express, which had done very well with the critics, but made no money. So nobody was anxious to give him another movie. Anyway, uh, Spielberg was over hanging out at uh, Zanuck and Brown's, and he saw the script, Benchley's script, and he picked it up and he said, you know, what's this? And he said, let me look at this. And then he sent me a copy with a note on it that said, eviscerate it. Oh, wow. so, I read, so I read it, and I, as, as was my habit in those days, if somebody was serious about a collaboration and sent me material, I would respond in writing. I'd write a memo about you know what I saw the strengths and weaknesses. You know, I, just, I, I took it seriously. So I sent Stephen the memo in which I made the most Accurate prediction and the worst prediction of all times, right in the same memo. The worst prediction was, I said, do you have to kill the girl in the first scene? I mean, this is such a teenage horror movie cliche. You have sex and then you die. You know, do we, <laughs> we have to do that. Which, as it, it kept out, me from having know. sex for a really long time, <laughs> if that means anything. Yeah. <laughs> That was, that was the reason. Okay. Well, that was, <laughs> no. That was one. That was one thing I thought was a weakness. I was wrong, obviously. The other thing I said was, if we do our job right on this film, people will feel about going in the ocean the way they feel about taking a shower after Psycho. 
<laughs> so you predicted that it would make Accurate. people afraid to go in the water? Yes, I said that. And for the next 45 years, whenever I meet anybody, they blame you. When I wrote Jaws, the first thing they say for 46 years, oh You're my God, a bitch. I, I, go, I, I didn't go in the swimming pool. I didn't go, didn't go to the bathroom. I didn't go in the shade. I didn't, you know, didn't go to the lake. I didn't go to the river. You know, I, people tell me all about how they didn't go in the water after that. My job as an actor is go, yes, I, you know, like, and I haven't heard that for 46 years. Does that give you some sense of satisfaction still, or are you just tired sure. of hearing I mean, you know, the, 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 As writers and artists, what we all strive for is you try to create something that becomes part of the culture, whether it's a catchphrase or a memorable character or a way of filming something. You know, just if, And that particular you know, movie and that, you know, that's... It's like you're going to need a bigger boat that's become part of the part of the culture. And, you know, you, you got to be proud of that, even though that's not what you intended and you can't plan on it. You know, we don't tell the audience what's a hit. They tell us. Uh, yeah. And, you know, and nobody knew right. it. So before the script was eviscerated, um, was there anything in it that was funny at all? Like, for, just for example, um, they're all going to die, or you're going to need a bigger boat, or no, none of that was in the script. It was a very serious script. Sackler was very literal. His great achievement was to put the Indianapolis speech in the movie. That wasn't there before. Okay, it's not in the novel. It's not in any of Benchley's draft. It, it, Sackler brought that to the table. Wow. And I discovered years later that Stackler stole part of that speech from a book called, I have it my Shark, Unpredictable Killer of the Sea. In the book Shark, the Herbie Robinson episode occurs verbatim. Wow. And Sackler wow. took it and put it in his version. Huh. And, and Shaw, when he rewrote it, he took that, you know, and, and put that in, in the Indianapolis speech. Well, Sackler's lucky he didn't grow up in the era of the internet because they would have like been on that immediately. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, Sackler included a lot of stuff from the novel that we had to take out. Basically, it was just a question of pruning. I mean, there was a subplot with the mayor and the mafia and the real estate developers and all that. And that, that we just took all that out and made it, you know. Moby Dick meets enemy of the people, men against the sea. So I got to ask you, since you wound up playing um, Meadows yeah. in the film, and this is like a, a two-part question because um, one, was it very, it had to have been very intentional for Spielberg to cast you knowing that that would get you time on the set to help with your writing. That was, that was my, that was, that was the reason for it. Okay. He said, look through the script, see if you can find a part for yourself. I'd like to have you there. Pick, pick somebody who's going to be, you know. So I picked Meadows because I still you know, had a lot of dialogue. He was in a lot of scenes. So I knew if I did Meadows and they took me on location, I'd be there for a long time. And that was great with Steven. He was fine with that. So okay. he cast me as Meadows. Um, I haven't read Benchley's book, but I know that Meadows is actually, a, I've heard he's actually a bigger character in the book. Yeah. Um, did you ever try and shoehorn any extra lines in for Meadows just because you knew oh, you were playing? Matter of fact, I, I, I use it as an illustration of what a conscientious writer I am. I cut my own dialogue because it wasn't necessary. I cut my character. Uh, the first day of filming my character, the first discovering the uh, wreck of the orca at sea, in the original script that was the shooting script of Jaws, Meadows and Hooper and Brody go out in a small boat and discover Ben Gardner's boat. And then Hooper goes over the side and gets the shock of his life. So um, when we were filming that scene, uh, as we filmed the approach to the Ben Gardner's boat, I leaned out to grab a, a rope to tie us together. And I fell in the water, completely unplanned. I just went head over heels into the into the Nantucket Sound with three cameras wow. rolling. 
<laughs> Is that footage anywhere still? <laughs> well, cut, cut, put, you know, they pulled me out. And because I was a secondary character, they didn't have doubles for my wardrobe. They didn't have a dry suit to put me in. So they would have had to wait for like three hours for the suit wow. to dry and to reshoot it. So they said, fuck it, we'll do it another way. Uh, never mind, let's move on. Let's, you know, we got other stuff to film. So they did. And then when, uh, as the film came together, I realized, you know, there's no reason for Meadows to be there when they discover Ben Gardner. So I wrote myself out of the scene. And it turned from being a daytime scene became a nighttime scene because we were going to have to film it in Los Angeles. We didn't have time to film it in Martha's Vineyard. So uh, for a lot of reasons, it became, it went from exterior day to exterior ocean day to exterior universal lake night with a lot of smoke to cover up the fact that you're on the back lot. So while we're on the subject of books, the Jaws blog um, by Carl yeah. Gottlieb, can you tell yeah. me, is this something that you were approached to write or is this something that you're like, I got to get this out? And can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, in those days, it was pretty early in the uh, merchandise and marketing era. You know, there was a lunchbox and a coffee mugs and T-shirts, but th that was about it. And uh, MCA Universal was getting into publishing. They even hired a vice president from Doubleday or to oversee publishing. And the original notion was to have a coffee table book of Jaws with three contributors, Spielberg writing as the director, Zanuck and Brown writing as the producers, and Benchley writing as the novelist. And Stephen asked me if I would ghostwrite his section because he was too busy. He was prepping, I think, Close Encounters. And he didn't have time. <laughs> Some other dumb time. picture. <laughs> yeah. He didn't have time to do it. So he asked me if I would do his third. And then the other guys had other stuff to do. Nobody wanted to do it. So they said, Carl, can you write a book about Jaws? Now, I had, you know, I was there. I talked to everybody. I said, yes, I can write a book. I went out, I interviewed all the people that I, you know, about all the events that I didn't witness per personally, like uh, the little guy had gone to Australia to do the underwater stuff. You know, they hired a, a little person to do five eighth scale work. Anyway, so I got the, so I went out and I interviewed everybody. Then I went off to a fat farm to lose weight and write the script. And very quickly, I, I finished the book and turned it in. And it was published to coincide with the release of the movie in uh, July of 75. Again, the rest is history. The book, book went through 23 printings, sold million, literally millions of copies. Uh, I didn't make much money for doing Jaws. I got paid for being an actor. I got paid for doing you know, 12 weeks on a rewrite. But that was relatively minimal money when you consider what the picture made. I had no right. percentage of the gross. But the Jaws log did so well that I made enough money to buy a house. And you did, out of Jaws, eventually get two other Jaws scripts. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it, it led to more and better. And, you know, my, and my place in history was secure. I mean, nobody knew it was going to be at that time. It was going to be an icon 45, 50 years later. But, you know, we knew it was going to be a popular movie. We could tell that just from the previews. But no, nobody saw it for what it was. Here's our synopsis for Jaws. And by the way, Carl will be back um, to provide his score um, and, uh, and a little bit more um, discussion. But that's for later. For now, we're going to tell you the, the plot synopsis of Jaws, which is a sheriff in a beach resort town has to deal with dead people. So, uh, Dames, have you ever been afraid of sharks? Yes. <laughs> because of this have, movie? Okay. You probably, I don't even know if you remember this, but we were always scared to go in the ocean. 
like oh. we would not go well, past I couldn't swim and it past, may be like our waist <laughs> past our waist and we always used to do the tin in the pool or in the ocean with our hands i mean this movie goes all the way back to as long as i can remember being in water with you so for the what's time, weird is what's weird is i don't actually remember the first time i've seen this movie um but i i just remember it always being a part of my life, but I don't specifically remember the first time seeing it, which is weird. What is your favorite part? Do you have a favorite part that you just... You know what? There's there's so many excellent and incredible pieces to this movie, but I have to tell you that my most, most adored and favorite scene is when they're swapping stories at sea uh, just before the... I mean, just it's, the, it's the calm before the storm, but like, yeah. I mean, it's like real. It's so real. Like everything in that scene is real. Like the laughing that they have and the, the terror that one imparts. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. Swapping, swapping scars. And then he's like, he throws something in about having his heart broken is like the whopper. <laughs> so and I just want to throw this back too. I am. 98% certain that Kevin Smith copped that for chasing Amy. The scene at the table where they're swapping stories about their um, sexual injuries. That it's written exactly. I mean, I will ask Kevin next time I see him, but, uh, and I'll I think, um, this, but I'd be surprised if he hasn't mentioned somewhere that he did get that from that, because I don't know if you know this, but I know it from watching comic book men. Um, so one of his best friends, Brian Johnson, his, I think it's his favorite movie is Jaws. So Brian Johnson's favorite movie is Jaws. And that's one of Kevin's, best. there's one episode of comic book men where they actually go to the Jaws museum and like Brian wants everything in there. Cause of it's course. like all the props and stuff. Um, so do I just, so, you, <laughs> so do I just so you know, if you could have one prop from Jaws. Oh dude. I mean, you got to go with the shark. Yeah. I mean, you have to, I don't, I'm I mean, sure there, and I think there's more than one version of Bruce oh, somewhere. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know where they all are, but I would love to have one. But um, if that was not available, I want that uh, Amity uh, welcome to Amity Island sign with the graffiti on it. Um, after people have been attacked by sharks. So my favorite part, I mean, I agree. Your scene that you described is awesome. Um, my favorite mini part of the movie is when he's yelling at his son to get out of the boat because he's like really nervous. He's yelling at Michael to get out of the boat. And then the mom's all like, he's never probably never going to go to the water again. But then she sees in the picture in the book of the shark attacking people. And then she's like, Michael, listen to your father out of the water okay. now. <laughs> That's a great moment, dude. And that's the kind of humor that I'm talking about that when um, you just heard us talk to Carl about like injecting funnier moments in the movie, I wonder, because that gets a laugh, dude. It's about a serious thing, but it gets a laugh. Just like you're going to need a bigger boat and um, dude, when everything he says you're all going to die. Matthew, everything that Matthew Hooper says or does in this He's film a, makes me laugh. Funny. Even the serious stuff, but he and he's great. Like it's not bad acting, or it's just Carl wrote this character. But I mean, Richard Dreyfus just brought it to life. Absolute money. Oh, and I don't think we've actually properly been able to give Carl enough credit yet for this. Um, believe it or not, because I heard in a podcast interview that he did that they could not get a hold of Richard Dreyfus. He was up and coming actor, um, had not been in anything like that blew the doors off the industry, but people were seeking him out, but he wouldn't like return their calls or anything. And Carl Gottlieb knew him and had his wife dial up um, his office or wherever, like dialed him up and Carl's wife got a hold of Richard Dreyfus. And um, he wound up accepting at that time because Carl was attached to it. So I can't imagine anyone else playing that role. 
I really can't. So we are going to give you Carl's score here first before we get into our final thoughts. Um, his score for the cult filmometer. It's pretty uh, fascinating little segment here. So now that you've had all this time, about what is it, 45? 46. 46 years to reflect on it. For our patented cult filmometer, we've heard some other scores from you. Um, zero to 100 for Jaws, the original. 95. 95? Okay. Love it. Is there anything that would have made it better in your mind that could have brought it to 100? Well, my father, who was an engineering student and a mathematician, used to quote a professor of his who said, the best you can hope for in this course is 97, uh, 98. God gets 100, I get 99. The best you can hope for is a 98. <laughs> so, you know, so maybe going on that basis, I'd, I'd go up to 98. Okay. <laughs> we talked you up three points. I love it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> um, I did hear you say, though, that um, this was in, a, I think, an interview you did for a Jaws podcast that um, because people wanted to make all these other creature features and shark movies in the wake of Jaws, um, that it's rather akin to like when people wanted to make rock band films. They're like, well, unfortunately, the Beatles made the first one and it was also the best one. So you're never going to do better than that. And so for Jaws, you guys just happen to make the best version yeah, possible. I mean, you know, they, the, the, uh, we, again, when, when we made, when the Beatles did uh, Hard Day's Night, they didn't know they were make, making the best rock and roll band movie of all time. They just made a good movie. They had a good director, four unique talents, a uh, great editor. You know, they, everything came together. Same thing with Jaws. Nobody knew. It just came together as a, an excellent piece of work. So I, you know, I make no apologies for that. And you should not have to. It is an infinitely watchable film. <laughs> it's an interesting thing. If you kind of check the length of the sideburns and the width of the lapels, it's a kind of a timeless movie. You know, the thing, there's no there's no cell phones in the movie, so you know you got that. But it it is kind of it's not 1975 on screen. It's, it could be 1980, it could be 1963, it could be 1994. It's all, you know, you have to look at the costumes and the hairstyles and the actors very carefully to isolate that movie in time. That's why it's timeless. I think that's, yeah, I think that's exactly why people, because there are, there. I think there are younger generations that are averse to watching older movies you know this is getting up there 45 years old but jaws is not one that i hear people say oh, i don't want to watch that that's an old movie that's you put it on a big screen and it works every time it's an audience pleasure machine i, I obviously i've seen it a number of times but every time i i go somewhere to do a signing or a guest appearance and they're screening jaws and i introduce it and we do q a afterwards so i'm in the i you know i kind of hang out in the audience or I sit in the lobby, but if I, if I hang out in the audience, I'll sit in the back and watch the reactions. And it plays the same today in Kansas City as it played in 1975 in Dallas. You know, It's amazing. They scream in the same place, they laugh, they cheer. An absolute pleasure discussing these things with you, sir. Oh, wow, that's incredible. 98 um, and you can't like say oh that's wrong you have to I, and i loved his logic nobody's ever quite put a score to it like that so. well i like his dad's his dad's addition to Wisdom. it as well <laughs> his dad's three points extra um now let's have another guest um let's get the score of one anthony hebert jaws fan super fan jaws fanatic hey guys tony bags talking about jaws Jaws is my number one favorite movie ever. Uh, I've been quoted as saying that Aliens is my favorite, Jurassic Park is my favorite, but it always comes back to Jaws. 
Jaws, the first summer blockbuster movie. Um, everything you see during the summer owes thanks to Jaws. Uh, I was in a movie theater a couple years ago watching a movie called Cloverfield. The guy walks out of the movie about halfway through screaming, just show the monster. And of course, I'm sitting there thinking, well, they're, they're doing an ode to Jaws. They're not showing the monster. And that was one of the great things about Jaws, not showing what was lurking underneath that water. You know, and of course, I always think back to Quint's USS Indianapolis speech. It doesn't get any better. Uh, if I had to rate this movie on the cult filmometer rating, it, it's going to be 100. I mean, it's everything that uh, I want in a movie. It's got the suspense. The dialogue's fantastic. The interactions between the three main characters on the Orca. That's where it's at, man. It's fantastic. All right, Dane. This movie, I I actually started writing a, um, an expose after our conversation with Carl because one thing that occurred to me during uh, the filming of this interview was this man, 46, 47 years ago, was writing this script for what he didn't know was going to be the biggest blockbuster of all time. They knew it was going to be a big movie, but they didn't know it was going to set the tone and, and create a whole new genre of film, which is a summer blockbuster. And just to think that that same man that we were talking to yesterday, 47 years ago, set out on a mission to write this and then ultimately ended up talking to us about it just kind of blew my mind quite a bit. Um, and I, I'm trying to put into words, written words, because obviously I'm blowing this, um, into how that's all possible and, and like what it means um, and how, how film just can transcend time, space, everything. And just uh, in a world where not everything is always cool, like this movie just kicks ass. Um, I have this. You want to hold up yours? I know you have the the universal, 4K, but I have the universal, universal one hundred digibook hundredth anniversary collection digibook. That's beautiful. And so um, the the um, the four K has a holographic slip case and has a booklet, Jaws booklet, and look who's on the back. Um, yeah, she's a. Uh, And then, and then this on the case, Jaws is eating the font. So it's not the original poster art um, at all, which well, on the back, they have this. So, I mean, people at Blu-ray at the studios, they like need to justify their, their art degrees or whatever, their graphic design degrees. So they... <laughs> Just come up with stuff like this instead of the original poster art. What's but. jams? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Jams uh, is if a anybody, if anybody Omaha. wants my di my digital copy, just go. read. Just freeze frame this, and you can have it. <laughs> here you go. Enjoy. So, All right. So overall, Dean, you know. Uh, how I rate movies, and they're up up against every other movie that's ever been made. So for me to give this a 94 lets you know um, just how special of a film I believe this to be. Well, I just want to say this. Didn't see the first shock for about half hour. Tiger. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to use any of that, but I just wanted to prove to you <laughs> that I can't do Robert Shaw without a British accent. And he's British and did himself without an accent, a British accent, because he did have some sort of an accent. All right. Jaws, I love you. You are, you're not a movie that I watch, um, obsessively i never have watched it obsessively but um it somehow just comes up that almost every year 
Jaws is on TV somewhere or we intentionally play it and it gets watched. Um, it's just like for as horrifying as some of the events in it are, it's just like one of the easiest movies to sit down and watch and just get completely engrossed in. It's uh, Some people would argue it's cult classic status because it wasn't a movie that was um, nothing and then later found life. It was a hit from the beginning. But um, that has bred a generation and multiple generations of people who are obsessive about it and obsessive people become cultish about things. Um, I, I think Tony would say it's a cult classic because um, he would start a cult about Jaws probably. Um, so its place here is justified. And um, I'm going to doppelgasm Carl Gottlieb's score. See this? That's a 98. You see? You see? Your stupid minds. Stupid. Stupid. Grab a cold one, blouses, because the score is 97.5. What the fuck? Oh my gosh, Dean. Well, Dean, a 97.5 makes that the highest film we ever done by quite a bit. <laughs> oh, what's just below it? What was the highest one before? There's nothing just below it. <laughs> Total, <laughs> Total Recall comes in at 93.5. Okay. So it's so a we're full looking at a four, four points point. better. <laughs> wow. And, and we can, uh, that four... We can Jaws 4. That's some joke that ties in Jaws 4. <laughs> <laughs> the revenge. Well, this has been CF3 for another week, and um, we've just done Jaws. So where do you go from here? I don't know. We're going to do a lot of great stuff. Um, we've got a lot of great Halloween stuff coming up in the party cast front for October. So please subscribe to Project Nerd. You're not going to want to miss any of this stuff. And um, we've got more Carl Gottlieb in our future as well. So please check us out. Check out all the other Project Nerd shows. We love you so much. We'll see you next time.